Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I am uh, Jim Grant, and uh, with me, as always, is the uh, engineer of the hour, Eric Whitehead to my left, uh, the great Evan Lorenz diagonally, and uh, directly across from me is uh, today's special guest, Richard Sandor. Richard Sandor, Ph.D., uh, chairman and CEO of the American Financial Exchange, the father of financial futures, a knight in the French Order of the Legion of Honor, director of science, honoris causa, from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Aaron, director, lecturer in law and economics at the University of Chicago Law School, and according to Time magazine, the hero of the planet. Hey, what's going on, Rich? Uh, <laughs> Thanks for that kind yeah, introduction, you know, I, Jim. The audience should know I edited the um, CV heavily to get down to uh, what may or may not be the quick and the essence. But uh, anyway, here we are. Richard, it is a pleasure to be with you. Now, Richard um, is not only saved the planet and not only instituted the... Uh, the great industry of financial, I guess, futurism, right? I don't know. Yeah. Um, but also is uh, has got a new hobby horse, and that hobby horse uh, has to do with a new benchmark money market interest rate for the world banking system, right, and others. And uh, you know, we ha- we have Richard, we have something called LIBOR. Yes. You know, tell tell us what's wrong with LIBOR and what's going to supplant it, please. Um, what's wrong with LIBOR is the fact that it's a poll. It's not really the election. It's like looking at a presidential. Oh, it's election. like Hillary, Hillary won. Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's just they call a number of banks and they yeah. say, "What do you think interest rates are?" And the consensus among those banks determines the price of. $250 trillion of derivatives, uh, how credit much is, cards. Uh, how much is that again? Uh, 250 trillion of, uh-huh. of debt swaps are linked to mortgages, LIBOR, loans. mortgages, variable rate hey, loans. Hey, Richard, answer, answer us this before we get too deeply into the alternative. How is it that the world's financial system was anchored to a rate which in 2012 turned out to be crooked? It was anchored by accident, Jim. What happened was a group of European banks made a loan in the early 80s to the Middle East, and they had to find, and it, at that time, interest rates, as you remember, because you covered it so brilliantly, were going, you know, to record levels. Ah, them was the days, Richard. Yeah, they were pretty uh, exciting, and and so they didn't want to make a fixed rate loan, so they decided to make a variable rate loan, and then they said, hey guys, what happens when we have to reset it? And they said, let's just call each other and figure out a consensus. So it never was intended to be a world benchmark rate. But certainly became one. And became one. In 2012, there was a scandal, uh, resolutions, and uh, you know, it's an odd thing, Richard. You know who took this thing over? ICE. Yes. It's the immigration outfit. Somehow (laughs) it's taken over the interest rate. (laughs) Jim, I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, no, it's true. And and there are some Democrats who want to abolish ICE, and there goes LIBOR. That's right. Right down the drain. You know what? We want to stop this before people take it seriously. Yeah. Okay, so ICE is a financial exchange. Right. And ICE is the exchange that bought the Chicago Climate Exchange, who you so graciously covered at, at one so point. So well done, Richard. You know, yeah. and so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, so anyway, ICE is now running this thing, but it's still a poll, right? It's still it's still an, it's still a, an opinion to a degree. Yes, it's it's a really a poll, although they're trying to improve it and they will improve it. But the fact is that the British government, the, the British regulators and the Fed have said said they don't look favorably on this. And our theory of the case was we woke up in 2012, Jim, and I saw a small article in the FT before the fines and all of the things coming saying that there was no trust in LIBOR. So I took our team and said, okay, guys, let's pivot because three things are going to happen. Um, I, number one, LIBOR is not going to be valid. And, and we have to build an exchange now to be around when it becomes invalid. Two, zero interest rates are not sustainable. And so, and and number three, the federal government couldn't be the borrower and the lender in capital markets. And if those three premises are right, there's room for an exchange where 
banks and non-banks borrow and lend to each other, and we could build a transparent, regulated market. So this, uh, this was this was not a, a made-up thing like the ones that uh, the governments and their central banks are now proposing. You were coming out and proposing to, as it were, to discover a rate in the marketplace. And you would, might have called this even, I, I'm just going to guess, it might have been called a Maribor. <laughs> Is that right? It's, it's a great wild guess, and, <laughs> and you hit it right on the head. We thought, this is very strange, London has LIBOR, yeah. Europe has EURIBOR, Hong Kong has HIBOR. How could it be we don't have an American well, what's, interest what's rate? what's become of Ameribor? Ameribor started to trade with six banks in, uh, two and a half years ago, and we traded 10 million a day and just bids and offers like any continuous market for bonds or for uh, stocks or anything like that. And we've grown from six members to 95 uh, with collective assets of one point three trillion dollars most of those yours are they they're <laughs> they are um they're really american um and so so how, so how many what uh, is the volume today uh we you're a piece of good luck jim well, our, our volume this week is over 900 million ah. a day and so we've grown from 10 million a day and we've added non-banks so in new york for example signature is a founding member new york community among the non-banks cerberus um jeffries and, 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 and how does ameribor stack up just as a quoted figure with say libor Great question. Um, you you're right on the mark. It's about twenty over LIBOR. This is un uh, Maribor is an unsecured rate. Is unsecured. Okay. Very important point. Well, this episode of uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air is brought to you in part uh, by ZipRecruiter. Now, um, every business needs people. Well, uh, nowadays, uh, you know. You need some people still. Al goes, yeah. some people, I guess. You need but, both, yeah. Uh, needs people, great people, and a better way to find them. So something better than posting a job online and just praying for the right person to see it is, in fact, the Zip Recruiter solution. Zip Recruiter knew there was a better, smarter and better way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. A Zip Recruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply for your job. Wait a second. Your yeah, job? Yeah. Maybe the job that you would like them to have as opposed to the job you yourself are holding. Yeah, good uh, clarification. So these invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80%, 80% of employees Employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate uh, through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter does not stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. Well, the right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. So businesses of all size trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners, our listeners, uh, can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right. F-R-E-E. -E. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. ZipRecruiter.com slash grant. The smartest way to hire. Now, Richard, the usual suspects, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, these cartelized too big to fail banks. Did I impugn their commercial integrity by calling them cartelized and too big to fail? I think I did. <laughs> yeah, I think and I'm gonna, did. I'm gonna repeat it. The cartelized <laughs> and too big. Okay, but it, it is the establishment now has come out and said we need a better rate than LIBOR, and they have not looked principally to the discovered real interest rate called Ameribor. They are looking instead to make up something, and they call it the secured overnight financing rate. So far, so unpronounceable. But this, but this is a uh, this is a secured rate. This is a, a direct derive from lending and borrowing treasury collateral, correct? That's correct. And this is what I don't get. It's fine, but it's secured. And I think, Jim, what would be very dangerous would be for us to go back to one size fits all. We have how many stock indices? Maybe more. We have the S&P, you have Dow Jones, you have NASDAQ, you have the Russell 2000. Yeah, they all go up. You, you all have... <laughs> You've got all these bond indexes. How can it be in commodities you've got Brent? All right. I, I got something to say on this point, Richard. Go ahead. All right. So um, I was uh, at a meeting of, uh, in New York City with a, with one of the Federal Reserve Board governors in uh, like 2010 or 12, 12, because the LIBOR stink was in the news. And uh, this uh, eminence talked about uh, the scandal of life. And I said, I asked a question innocently enough. I said, uh, tell me, uh, Jeremy, I said, uh, abstracting 
from the legality of the question, what is the substantive economic difference between, on the one hand, uh, the bros in London manipulating LIBOR, and on the other hand, the Central Bank of the United States manipulating the funds rate? And you know what he said? Nothing of substance to that question. What you want is, is a rate they don't manipulate, right? Yeah, you want a free market rate. We have Say it that in you want a free market determined interest American rate. American life, uh, yeah, and, Ameribor. Ameribor, and one that is transparent, where there's a tape, where you can see every transaction, all right, all right. and there's volume, and it's regulated. All right, so and that's what we want. So these central banks have produced these uh, these alternatives to LIBOR, and they sound like a bunch of pharmaceutical labels. Listen to this. So the British <laughs> have advanced something called Sonia. Does it want to make you go to sleep? It sounds like a damn sleeping pill, doesn't yeah. it? And then there is the Japanese and they have Tonar, which to me, I don't know, I, it's maybe just me, but this suggests Sonar, which brings to mind all manner of <laughs> geopolitical difficulties. That, you know, okay, that's Japan. And then the Swiss have Saron, oh, for Pete's sake. It, it's, it's, Saron sounds like something that the Russians would drop in London. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> yeah. So um, so, anyways. So. I know, but the point that I think is that you're hitting, you know, with all of these, is most people, including most corporations, don't borrow money at a secured rate based on treasury. So we said, some people do, okay, but the vast- Mostly professional financial people. Just... Yeah, but but very few people, you know, you take corporates, you take banks, you take the people who produce the jobs, the, yeah. the small businesses, they borrow at an unsecured rate. And if banks are to hedge themselves, then they need to hedge it in an unsecured market. Because... Now, are you, are you you're then competing with this idea of SOFR, right? This, you're, this, these are these are people your enemies. I they're not really because they serve a very small part of the market. But they we, want to take over the whole market, don't they? I don't know, Jim. Honestly, if they want to, they want to to get a rate that serves their interests. And 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 we decided we'd rather go for six thousand small banks than the top thirty five no, large is, banks. Is there room for both? Is there room for Ameribor and SOFR? and Sonar and uh, Saren and, uh, and uh, yes. Sophia. Whatever. Yes. Okay. Yes. There's room not only for those two, there's room for lots of others. Like I said, with stock indexes, why in the world should one rate be in existence when risk rates differ? You better than anybody yeah. else knows. Now, the answer is this one. Okay. So the, one, of, one of our friends in Chicago, Jim Bianco, has, uh, has called SOFR New Coke. Is that, is that, um, it's clever, but is it a posit? Is that, uh, does that hit at something essential in SOFR? Is it, is it a disimprovement masking as an improvement? I think it's, it's again, at least it's collected from real transactions that reported by the Fed. So it's better and, but it, in our contention, it serves a very different need and the need that medium-sized regional banks have. So this broadcast is uh, brought to you uh, in part by our friends at Purple Mattress. Now, here's a question, son Phil Grant. Yes. Ready? Mm -hmm. How'd you sleep last night? Poorly. Oh, it was yeah. probably what? Uh, the, the the absence of uh, space-age material was, was one factor, I think. So it was the mattress, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Uh, if you're struggling to get a good night's sleep, try a Purple Mattress. So the Purple Mattress will probably feel different than anything you've ever experienced because it uses this brand new material that was developed by an actual rocket scientist. Not like some quant, right? Not, not uh, some, you know, fake Wall Street rocket scientist. This is in rocket surgery. Yeah. It was not like the memory foam that you're used to. The Purple material feels unique because it's both firm and soft at the same time. So it keeps everything supported while still feeling really comfortable. Plus, it's breathable so that it sleeps cool. So, a 100-night risk-free trial. If you're not satisfied, uh, you can return your mattress for a full refund, 10-year warranty, and free shipping and returns. You are going to love Purple, and right now, our listeners will get 10% off the entire order in addition to this week's free gift. Yeah, free gift with the purchase of a mattress. Just 
Go to purple.com and use the promo code GRANT, G-R-A-N-T, at checkout. That's purple.com slash GRANT. The only way to get 10% off plus your free gift is to use the code GRANT at checkout, purple.com slash GRANT. You know, uh, some people have uh, been speculating that the transition between uh, LIBOR and alternatives might be legally fraught. Uh, For instance, there is... um, uh, in the contractual language of some of these LIBOR contract, I gather in many trillions of dollars worth of them, uh, that um, uh, lenders can renegotiate the terms of the agreement if there is a change in the base rate. In fact, I think Fitch has quoted $4 trillion worth of LIBOR-linked loans are renegotiable in case there's a change in the base rate. Do you, as a law student of law and also as a professor of law, do you anticipate a great big legal kerfuffle if the people go ahead and say, the authorities go ahead and say, by 2021, we have to be real LIBOR? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we did. And Jim, we jointly sponsored... um, with the University of Chicago, a seminar that was called uh, the transition in benchmark interest rates from ah. SOFR, Ameribor, and beyond. And the theory of the case, we had law professors speak. We had Kirkland and Ellis. We had Ernst and Young talking about all of the transitional issues. And I think this is getting to be like Y2K. Ah. And unless people start waking up very shortly to the transitional needs, and we did have, by the way, Dr. David Bowman, who was the principal architect of so for there, who said quite directly he was an agnostic whether it comes to Sofer or Maribor, and he was very candid. He say he just said, and it's available on the University of Chicago website. There's a danger with people continuing to use LIBOR, and this was a wake-up call. Um, he's quite bright, quite capable. We had Randy Krosner, who was a Fed governor. We had Kirkland and Ellis okay. talking about CLOs, CDOs. When, when was this? You this was. April 4th. Uh, it's on the University of Chicago. Well, April 4th, as it happens, was one of the, uh, I think, uh, April 4th is about the time that the New York Fed began to miscalculate SOFR. That's now, isn't, the... <laughs> isn't, wasn't that a yeah. kick when to watch the uh, the SOFR launch two weeks later, April 16th, I think, New York's Fed comes out and says that uh, it has this somewhat prolix and a little bit, uh, and, and rather written in the passive voice, press release uh, disclosing that, yeah, the, the rate wasn't quite as accurate as it might have been. <laughs> now, is that just a shakedown cruise problem, or is this potentially indicative of calculation dif- difficulties that might... That might uh, persist. It, I think it's a kerfuffle at the start. Having started a lot of new markets, boy, you got to have a shakeout period, but also the need for choice. I, a menu is what you want. Or competition, I, right? And competition is what you want. And, and anybody can have a kerfuffle, but if your choices are more than one and you don't you can go to three restaurants and not one if one's got a food problem you can you can <laughs> you go don't ha- you don't someplace. have you don't have to go back for tomain again yeah, do you? you don't have no. to go back for romaine lettuce which may <laughs> not be as you exactly liked but all of us can make mistakes not um, around here richard no, I guess, uh, no. I, have, so in terms of choices, um, so first, as you pointed out, is a collateralized rate, whereas a Maribor is is just uh, not not collateralized. It's, you know, um, unsecured. Right. So there's $250 trillion worth of, you know, contracts written in LIBOR outstanding. What kind of contracts would a Maribor suit better? Which ones would SOFR suit better? What kind of market cap might actually go towards one or towards the other? Great question. And Jim's previous was terrific. It's great being with you guys. <laughs> we have a history together, but I really rarely get asked the right questions, and and these are the right Quite questions. Wait till midnight. We think of our best questions yeah, later. No, no yeah. I do too. It's, I should have, would have, should have, whatever. <laughs> that's, the, in that spirit. Yeah. The, the question is, I think SOFR is probably well suited to the big banks because they're very active in the repo market and they're there. 
I think our rates are better for the signatures, the key bank, the the regional banks, and the community banks. And is, the small is, it the, banks. is it the is it the issuers or is it the product? Like, is it better to have like an interest rate derivative on SOFR or maybe like a leverage loan tied to a Maribor? Or is it if you're J.P. Morgan, you're going to use SOFR for everything? Yeah, you may if you're J.P. Morgan. And I wouldn't put words in in Jamie Dimon's mouth, but. If you borrow at an unsecured rate, you want to hedge in a rate that's unsecured. You don't want to. We know what happens to the TED spread. It's like an accordion, you know, and it goes out from 20 to 400 back to 20. And you could actually end up by hedging have higher basis risk than you have absolute interest rate risk. So it could be interest rates could go that up. That kind of hedge. That kind of hedge. <laughs> That's in Chicago, we call that a Texas hedge. Yeah, well, you know, in you Texas, get... they call it that. <laughs> Would this lead to adverse selection for clients? Because if I am um, a highly leveraged private equity, you know, sponsored company, and I can get a slightly cheaper loan if I borrow from a bank in SOFR than Ameribor, would this lead to even more concentration on the financial system? Look, I, I, I feel if you have a choice, it's better. Okay, we don't know much in economics, and I've been a student of it, a professor of it. For one thing we know, yeah, the, and yes, that yes, is Richard. that is <laughs> it's better to be diversified than not diversified. I think all of the finance papers, everything that you can read for 50 years, the from one Harry truth, Mark, the one truth. it's better to have a choice than not have a now, choice. Now, Richard, um, is it any accident that uh, that LIBOR is, is higher than? So far, for example, today, uh, LIBOR called make it 230, 230 yeah. odd basis points. So far, uh, 190. So about four tenths of one percentage point higher is LIBOR. Now, is there any accident that the establishment prefers so far? Is this a nose under the tent <laughs> of spec? Well, it it really is is hard to say. Um, I don't oh, think be they're not they're be not indiscreet. Not, no, no, I I. I am being indiscreet in the following way. There are apples and oranges because that rate is the the LIBOR rate is a 30 day rate and or a 90 day rate as opposed to an overnight. One would expect the risk free rate to be lower yes. than the the unsecured and and it's really going to depend because and we had this discussion here with some names that you would be very familiar with 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 money market folks and and asset managers and question came up and I said have you really thought this through because you could have two kinds of money market funds you could have one that's secured and ones that unsecured you got to be careful if you put all your bags in one closet you know you're going to be in trouble you because your investors might want the unsecured risk, not the secured risk. That that would be better rate of return on a risk-adjusted basis. You know, uh, Richard, thank you for this enlightening uh, look into the uh, the great battle of the interest rates. Before closing, I would like you to reflect on um, the state of currencies in this world. On Monday, I think it was, the Wall Street Journal came out and said, in view of the persistent seeming intended depreciation, of the Chinese renminbi on the one hand, and on the other, the president's expressed dissatisfaction with the appreciation of the dollar uh, and the looming uh, disruption, if not chaos, of the world's uh, trading system. Do we really need uh, these movable exchange rates and this seemingly disorderly monetary regime? Now, this speaks to the Milton Friedman vision of a world of floating currencies, all of us rationally hedging, very University of Chicago. And uh, we've had uh, 47 years of it since Bretton Woods bit the dust. Have you thought about the restoration of fixed exchange rates anchored by gold bullion? I have, actually. Not a lot, Jim. You and I know as students of economics that that flexible exchange rates <clears throat> were ways for governments to adjust stickiness in the wage and product market. So when things were not going the well and you and you were in an economic slowdown, you could devalue your currency and that would bail you out. So it was a response to have flexible rates because of rigidities in the real economy and, and you could get yourself out of trouble by adjusting your currency. 
currency. We've got a peculiar system now because we we have central banks that determine the currencies. They support them actively or not. We have not free trade completely. You know, we've got stickiness in, in wage and in capital markets. And so, you know, in, in, a, in an ideal world, a, a currency backed by cold is, is a University of Chicago kind of approach to it. It is makes it impossible to debase the, the currency. But as a practical matter, I don't think so. I think the real interesting question, I just finished a book, it's out a couple of weeks ago, called From Electronic Trading to the Blockchain. And I think what you really have to keep track of is cryptocurrencies, asset-backed cryptocurrencies, um, and trends in the blockchain, which I think is a, the, the next major, that we make the point in the book that the next major disruption is important, if not more important than electronic trading is going to be the blockchain. Yeah, well, um, Richard Sandor, uh, PhD, doctor of science, Whatever. savior <laughs> of the planet. Thank you for being with us at Grant's Interest Review. Uh, Jim, let me thank, thank you if I can interrupt you. You know, you've always been somebody I've tremendously respected and followed over the years. So it's really a fun thing for me personally to well, be here, it and is, it's an it honor. It has been delight for all of us around the table. And uh, until next time, I should thank you. Thank you.